Hello and most welcome to 1319. It's going to be the first time in a year almost lecture at night. But since this is Boxing Day, it's been a lot of preparation or the opposite of preparation, putting everything back into place. I will swiftly or soon move also. So I need to prepare for that move. And speaking about movement, this has been suggested from the master himself to make a comparison between Wittgenstein and Heidegger. And for that I will start lightly because this is not a light subject with reading an article of Livingstone, if you remember him, who has been into the lecture hall before. Uh, this is an article called Wittgenstein reads Heidegger and Heidegger reads Wittgenstein. Let's see what that could be about. Thinking language bounding world is the main title. This is a tale of two readings and of a non-encounter the missed encounter between two philosophers whose legacy as has been noted might jointly define the scope of problems and questions left open for philosophy today. In particular, I will discuss today Two remarks, one by Wittgenstein on Heidegger and the other by Heidegger on Wittgenstein. As far as I know, the first is the only recorded remark by Wittgenstein about Heidegger. And the second is one of only two by Heidegger about Wittgenstein. as readings. Both remarks that I shall discuss are at best partial, elliptical and glancing. Interestingly, as I shall argue, each is actually a suggestive misreading of the one philosopher by the other.
by considering the two misreadings. I shall argue we can understand better the relationship between the two great 20th century investigators of the still obscure linkages among being, language, and truth. And we can gain some insight into some of the many questions still left open by the many failed encounters of 20th century philosophy. Including what might be considered the most definitive encounter that is still routinely missed, miscarried or misunderstood. The encounter between the traditions of analytic and continental philosophy, which are still widely supposed to be disjoint. I begin with a sole recorded remark by Wittgenstein on Heidegger. It comes in the course of a series of discussions between Wittgenstein and members of the Vienna Circle. Held in the homes of Friedrich Weismann and Moritz Schlick. And later collected under the title Wittgenstein and the Vienna Circle. The remark dated December 30th, 1929 reads 
on Heidegger. I can very well think what Heidegger meant about being and angst. Man has to drive to run about upon against the boundaries of language. Think, for instance, of the astonishment that anything exists. This astonishment cannot be expressed in the form of a question. And there is also no answer to it. All that we can say can only a priori be nonsense. Nevertheless, we run up against the boundaries of language. Kierkegaard also saw this running up. and similarly pointed it out. This running up against the boundaries of language is ethics. I hold it certainly to be very important that one makes an end to all the chatter about ethics. Whether there can be knowledge in ethics, whether there are values, whether the good can be defined, etc. In ethics, one always makes the attempt to say something. Which cannot concern and never concerns the essence of the matter. It is a, a priori certain. Whatever one may give as a definition of the good. It 
it is always only a misunderstanding to suppose that the expression corresponds to what one actually means. But the tendency to run up against shows something. The Holy Augustine already know this. When he said, What? You scoundrel, you would speak no nonsense. Go ahead and speak nonsense, it doesn't matter. The remark was first published in the January 1965 issue of the Philosophical Review. Both in the original German and in an English translation by Max Black. In that version, in both the German and English texts, Weismann's title the first sentence and the last sentence were there omitted. So that the remark as a whole appeared to make no reference either to Heidegger or to Augustine. Whatever this might indicate about the analytic continental divide at the time of that publication, the remark itself shows that Wittgenstein had some knowledge of the contents of being in time. and that he held its author at least in some esteem. The comparison with Kierkegaard, whom Wittgenstein also greatly respected, shows that he recognized and approved of the marked existentialist undertone of being and time.
and understood the deep Kierkegaardian influence on Heidegger's conception there of angst. or anxiety as essentially linked to the possibility of a disclosure of the world as such Indeed, in Being and Time, Heidegger describes angst as a distinctive way in which Dasein is disclosed. and as essentially connected to the revealing of the structure of being in the world, which is, in turn, one of the most essential structures of Dasein. Thus, for Heidegger, it is angst which first discloses the joint structure of Dasein and being in the world as such. Since angst is not fear before an individual or individuals, but as a kind of discomfort of the world as such, The world as such is that in the face of which one has angst. According to Heidegger, and this is evidently thus close to the experience that Wittgenstein calls astonishment <coughs> that anything exists It is an index of the extraordinary diversity of Wittgenstein's philosophical influences.
as well as evidence against the often heard claim that he either did not read the history of philosophy or did not care about it. That he manages in this very compressed remark to mention approvingly, in addition to Heidegger and Kierkegaard, two philosophers whose historical contexts and philosophical methods could hardly be more different. G. E. Moore and St. Augustine. The concern that links Augustine, Kierkegaard, Moore and Heidegger across centuries of philosophical history and despite obviously deep differences is something that Wittgenstein does not hesitate to call ethics. Although his own elliptical discussions of the status of ethics and its theory are certainly anything but traditional. Some years earlier, in the Tractatus, Wittgenstein had described ethics very briefly and elliptically as transcendental. Holding that it is impossible for there to be propositions of ethics. And that ethics cannot be put into words. The position expressed in this brief passage is further spelled out in the brief lecture on ethics 
that Wittgenstein had delivered to the heretics society in Cambridge on November 17th, 1929, six weeks before the remark on Heidegger. In the lecture, Wittgenstein considers <clears throat> the status of what he calls partially following more absolute judgments of value. Judgments that simply, that something simply is valuable, obligatory, or good in itself. Without reference to anything else that it is valuable for. His thesis is that no statement of fact can ever be or imply a judgment of absolute value. This is because all facts are in themselves on the same level and no fact is inherit inherently more valuable than any other. In a book written by an omniscient author and containing descriptions of all bodies and their movements as well as all human states of mind. and thus containing the whole description of the world. There would nevertheless be no ethical judgments or anything implying one. For even statements 
of relative value or descriptions of human states of mind would themselves simply be descriptions of facts. It follows that there can be no science of ethics. For nothing we could ever think or say should be the thing. Nevertheless, there remains a temptation to use expressions such as absolute value and absolute good. What then is at the root of this inherent temptation? And what does it actually express? express? Speaking now in the first person, Wittgenstein describes the idea of one particular experience. which presents itself to him when he is tempted to use these expressions. This experience is Wittgenstein says his experience par excellence associated with the attempt to fix the mind on the meaning of absolute value. I believe the best way of describing it is to say that when I have it, I wonder at the existence of the world. And I am then inclined to use such phrases as how extraordinary 
that anything should exist. Or how extraordinary that the world should exist. a paradigmatic experience of ethics for Wittgenstein is thus the experience that one might attempt to express by saying one wonders at the existence of the world. Nevertheless, as Wittgenstein immediately points out, the expression necessarily fails in that it yields only nonsense. For although it makes sense to wonder about some things being the case that might not have been, or might have been otherwise. It makes no sense to wonder about the world's existing at all. It is thus excluded at the outset that what one is tempted to describe as the experience of such wonder can be meaningfully expressed. And it is a kind of paradox that any factual or psychological experience should even so much as seem to have this significance. And if someone were to object that the existence of an experience of absolute value might indeed be just a fact among others. for which we have as yet not found the proper analysis. Wittgenstein suggests that it would be possible 
to see as it were in a flash of light that every possible attempt to describe absolute value would yield only nonsense rooted in the desire to go beyond the world and that is to say beyond significant language significant language means a language that can be heard and understood <clears throat> What is nevertheless expressed in metaphors such as these metaphors such as that of the vast structural correspondence of language and the world. the coming into existence or creation of the world itself. The great and elaborate allegory. which represents God as seeing everything, but also as a human being of great power, whose grace we try to win. As Wittgenstein notes in the lecture, the curious peculiarity of metaphors of this type is that while metaphors <coughs> more generally are metaphors for something these cannot be replaced with a literal description of the facts they are metaphors for since there are no such facts that they nevertheless arise at the point of the temptation which also yields the incoherent attempt to mark the place of the absolute value might then be thought to indicate that their attempt is also the one that thought makes in trying to touch a point of the absolute.
the real corresponding to the totality of the world or its grasping as a whole from a point beyond it. The point at which the value of the world if it has value, could be assayed. The price of this attempt, however, is the admission of its necessary failure. The impossibility of anchoring thought at such a point of the real without contradiction, paradox or the nonsense of metaphors that cannot be cashed in. For their literal meaning. Since what they stand for is literally nothing. Returning to the remark of December 30th, Wittgenstein's suggestion here is then that all of the philosophers he mentions can in fact be read in different ways as having understood this impossibility for ethics or ethical propositions to come to expressions. The theory of ethics is futile. in that the attempt to establish ethics as a positive knowledge or science to determine the existence and nature of values. or as Moore had suggested, to define the good itself. Can only yield the chatter of a continually renewed nonsense. that perennially fails to recognize itself 
as such. At the same time, however, it is in this essential failure to be expressed or expressible that Wittgenstein suggests the real yield of all attempts at ethical thought might ultimately be found. This is because of the link between the tendency to run up against the boundaries of language and what we should like to call the radical experiences of our relation to the world as such. including even the feeling that we may express as our astonishment that anything exists at all. Something very similar is indeed suggested by Heidegger's notorious discussion of being and nothingness in the Freiburg inaugural lecture, What is Metaphysics? delivered on July 24th, 1929. Here, the experience of the nothing by means of which it is first possible for us to find ourselves among beings as a whole, thereby allows being as a whole to be revealed. Even if comprehending the whole of beings in themselves is nevertheless impossible in principle. In the moods or attunements of boredom and anxiety we are brought face to face with beings as a whole and in the very unease we feel in these moods towards being as a whole 
also brings us a fundamental attunement. That is also the basic occurrence of our Dasein. as exhibited in an experience of nothing and annihilating in which Dasein is all that is still there. This experience also gestures toward a kind of dysfunction of speech. And logos. Anxiety robs us of speech and in the face of anxiety all utterance of the is falls silent. And notoriously, Heidegger holds that in the encounter with the nothing, logical thinking itself must give way to a more fundamental experience. He says, if the power of the intellect in the field of inquiry into the nothing and into being is thus shattered, then the destiny of the reign of logic in philosophy is thereby decided. The idea of logic itself disintegrates in the turbulence of a more original questioning. It would thus not be amiss to see Wittgenstein's invocation of this sense of wonder at existence. In both the remark on Heidegger and in the lecture on ethics. As suggesting significant parallels to the thought of a philosopher whose signature is the question of being. and the disclosure of its fundamental structures, including the basic experiences, such as that of angst, 
in which the being of the world as such here the totality of beings may be disclosed yet as reading of Heidegger's actual position in being and time the main suggestion of the passage that these experiences are to be found by running up against the boundaries of language. is nevertheless essentially a misreading. For being in time contains no detailed or even very explicit theory of language. As such, let alone the possibility of running up against its boundaries. And insofar as being and time discusses language, die Sprache, the discussion is almost wholly subordinated to the discussion of Rede or concretely practiced discourse. Thanks for getting it. So it's supposed to be only if they can express the language. There is, you can take some question here. There's especially one paragraph that is especially interesting here. that is that about the metaphor and that the metaphor cannot be seen in this case as corresponding to facts and by facts here one could also say words even though the metaphor is made of words it sort of is beyond words it is like a painting of words. And I think that is, in my case, how I've been thinking about these things, there will always be someone who says, what does the metaphor really mean? And by there, they want to, to have an explanation of the metaphor in facts. And according to Wittgenstein, that would not be possible. And it's also 
very close to each other, the arguments here. They are so close they overlap, how they are expressed. On the one hand, he says, you cannot talk about it, but you can have a metaphor of it. But that metaphor cannot be explained. It would be nonsensical to explain it. And I would connect this to being with a big B because from that big being all beings follow from the undecided factless comes everything else this originary more founded meaning almost like a fountain of meaning that goes into the others. Do note we haven't gotten into Heidegger really here. Uh. <clears throat> um, Wittgenstein would say that ethics, would it be possible to say that ethics can be found in etymology then? If, if it's not in the world, perhaps it's in the language itself. He, he connects ethics to language in some way. Uh, or at the same way, at the same manner, he doesn't do that. It, it, you cannot uh, express ethics with words. No, but you can use a metaphor. Yes, you can use a metaphor. Hmm. And the, the metaphor <clears throat> is not it wouldn't make sense to tell what are the facts to say the question what does the metaphor mean is impossible so it's it's a bit like language in wittgenstein's sense is much more than we usually see it's bigger more founding because if it were small enough, we could ask the question, what does it mean? It would sort of be inside of our uh, grasp. But for Wittgenstein, language is immensely much bigger, with much more power. And I think this this is why God is mentioned. By telling what, no sorry, good. God is also mentioned, but good is mentioned. But telling what good is would make good into something much smaller. It would be in the, my graspability, so to speak. And that good would not be bigger than I am and in a way it would not extend beyond myself. This is a reversal of the private language argument, seeing it from the outside, that defining good would make it very small, so small that it wouldn't have the value that language has, we know it has. And the opposite would be to say, I would not be able to understand my own words, since I made their meaning infinitesimally small, 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 small. It's a sort of a Wittgensteinian why question. The why of the being becomes the first thing to ask. And if you don't do that, you are, you can only have the leftovers, which is uh, where, how, what.
Augustine comes in here also. What do you think about that, Kalle? Hmm, let me... What, in what context was it again? Let me see... Um, yes, so... The quotation goes as this. But, you scoundrel, you would speak not nonsense. Go ahead and speak nonsense, it doesn't matter. It's very good, actually. It's... Uh... Someone trying to define good or God, mm. and he says it doesn't matter because your words don't have any meaning. You're not even able to do destruction. <laughs> and I don't think he meant that in a pejorative way. He just wanted to show that words can lose their power if we try to define them. Because that's the process of making them smaller. I often think of this, I think it's called funnel in English. And it looks like this, when you want to put some liquid into a bottle. And this is the defining process. It doesn't mean that you cannot define certain words in the normal way. But you cannot define good ethics because it is as big as language slash the world. And by defining it, you make it so small that your words doesn't even have harmful influence. This is what Augustine is pointing to your words become worthless or wordless maybe could be a better point to say. This is still in the beginning so we don't know much about what Heidegger will say in this context. It's just a little hint but should we make some guesses here? It could be fun. What Heidegger would say, do you mean? No. Well, what, how does Heidegger come into the context, if at all, you think? Uh, for him, um, language is the house of being. This is a famous quote by Heidegger. So ethics for Heidegger would be in the language, is my guess, but... Uh, <clears throat> mm, yeah, that's good, that's good. So you end up with language anyhow, any way. <clears throat> yeah, but uh, yes, I would say uh, my guess is I haven't gone so far, but also that Heidegger feel, feels that it's, it's a rather big thing. It's, uh... yeah, I mean, my, my proposal would be that um, today, okay, definition is not bad, but it's very limited, as you said. Uh, but what Heidegger would do, he would take the etymology into, into consideration. That is the, what gives you the real the death. Okay, good. Okay, you can define good or ethics. But he would go through, he would first begin with the etymology of ethics. Yes. That would be his B very good. way. Uh, might I stop you there? Autonomy is, is uh, much wider because it goes into the history. Whereas what Wittgenstein means, I define what good is. It would be me only as a, an unhistorical person. And that is limiting. Yes, it could be the case. Yeah, I think you have a good point there. By etymology, it becomes much deeper. And it doesn't become constricted in the way. Because etymology is not definition in the way it's mentioned here. It is rather an expansion. And of course, that has to do with the two words Geschichte and Historia, 
in Heidegger. And Historia is more close to defining it according to myself, whereas Geschichte is this living and living entity, which could be compared to etymology. Hmm, very good. We're looking forward. Uh, I think in a couple of lectures I will go forward with this interesting comparison. I say thank you very much and have a very pleasant evening. Thank you for this paper by Paul Livingstone. Thank you.